This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. To see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly. And also today to hear thee more clearly. These things we pray. Amen. Amen. What's the best birthday present you can give someone who is 100 years old? How about a whole new start in life, a new name, and a new baby? (laughs) If I ever get to be 100, please don't celebrate my birthday that way. But that's what God promised Abraham for his 100th birthday. Everyone gets a new name and a new identity in today's scripture lessons. Abram, which means exalted father or ancestor, becomes Abraham, which in Hebrew is a play on words, making him the exalted father of many nations. Sarai will give birth to the promised heir, And she also receives a new name, Sarah. The meaning of that name change in Hebrew is unclear, but she also takes on a new identity. Even God gets a new name in today's scripture. The Lord has appeared to Abram before, but this time he appears to Abram and says, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai, God of the mountain or God on high. In today's Gospel of Mark, we too are offered a new identity, but it comes with a cost. Only those who are willing to lose their life, who take up their cross and follow, can hope to find new life in Christ. My favorite part of the whole Abraham narrative is a bit left out of today's scripture. If you continue on reading for a couple more verses, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to to God, oh, that Ishmael, Ishmael was his son by the slave woman, might live in your sight. And God said, no, your your wife Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring forever. And of course, the name Isaac means laughter. God visits Abraham again in the next chapter of Genesis and again promises that Abraham and Sarah will have a son. But this time, it's Sarah who overhears the conversation, and she falls down and laughs in her tent. The heir on whose God's promise and Abraham's faith rest is named laughter. One of my favorite authors, Frederick Beekner, um, in a short article on faith asked, why did the two old crocs laugh? <laughs> they laughed because they knew only a fool would believe that a woman with one foot in the grave was soon going to have her other foot in the maternity ward. <laughs> they laughed because God expected them to believe it anyway. They laughed because God seemed to believe it. They laughed because they half believed it themselves. They laughed because laughing felt better than crying. They laughed because of some crazy chance happened that it happened and it might come true. They would really have something to laugh about. And in the meanwhile, it helped them to keep going. Then in Romans, The Apostle Paul tells us that it was Abraham's faith that was reckoned to him as righteousness. What was most important for God was that Abraham believed and trusted in this crazy promise that he and Sarah would have a son from whom God would make a mighty nation. That promise took them far from their homeland in what is modern-day Iraq, to wander all their days in search of both a promised land and a promised child. 
They may have laughed, but they kept trusting in that crazy promise. This, Paul emphasized, not Abraham's obedience to a law that still wouldn't come into existence for hundreds of years, but his trust in a promise is what was reckoned to him as righteousness. So we are children of Abraham, not by virtue of having been born as a descendant, but through emulating a faith like his. In essence, Paul is telling the Romans and us that we should trust the same crazy promise. In an odd way, what Paul tells us bears resemblance to the conversation between the White Queen and Alice in Lewis and Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. The Queen has just told Alice that she is 101 years, five months, and one day old. Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. I can't believe in impossible things. I dare say you haven't had pr much practice, said the Queen. When I was much younger, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Paul is inviting us to believe in impossible things. And isn't that what the Christian faith is all about? Isn't faith in impossible things what taking on an, a new identity in Christ is all about? We're not, we're not only invited to believe in God who we cannot see or hear or touch, directly with any of our senses, we're invited to believe that the almighty God, who is the creator of the universe, empties himself of all power and divinity to be born as a tiny baby, thus revealing himself through the vulnerability of human life that we can both understand and relate to. We're invited to believe, furthermore, that God's power and strength are revealed in this human being in Jesus, not in his victories, not in his huge following, or even in his miracles, but rather in his sacrificing everything, his emptying of himself and dying for us on a cross, a shameful death of a common criminal. Believing such impossible things proved too difficult for Peter in today's gospel story. But Jesus told Peter, his disciples, and us, if anyone want to follow, if anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. We're invited to believe that in Jesus' death, God defeated death. We're invited to believe that death could not hold Jesus and that God raised him from the dead. And in this world where death still seems so often to rule, we're invited to believe that we too will triumph over death and share in Christ's resurrection victory. We're believed to invite in that power of the resurrection, not only when we die, but also for today, to live right now in that resurrection power. We're invited to follow Jesus' claim that greatness comes not through what we accumulate or our power over others, but in emptying ourselves of our possessions and emptying of ourselves of our pretenses and serving others. We're invited to eat a little bit of bread and drink a tiny sip of wine, and by doing so, to receive the living presence of Jesus' body and blood. We're invited to believe further that this sacrament connects us somehow in communion with Christ and with one another and with Christians everywhere, both the living and the dead. We're invited to belong to a church which we proclaim in the creed as one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. But at the same time, we see it fractured, divided, and often at odds with Christians of differing viewpoints and practices. Is there any use trying? Can we, as Alice laughingly asked the White Queen, believe in impossible things? 
Well, consider where belief in these impossible things may lead us. Isn't God, who is beyond the realm of human touch or sight or hearing, a far better ideal to believe in than that all the possessions and strengths and pleasures and power of this world? Isn't the good news of God's improbable victory over death through Jesus' death on a cross and God raising him from the dead the best news you ever heard? Do we not find strength and spiritual sustenance in believing that this bread and wine bring us into literal communion with Christ? Would we not want to believe in the power of healing when so much is broken and need of it? When we do follow Jesus by offering ourselves in love and service and acts of charity, both large and small, don't we share Christ's love and living presence with him? And isn't Christ's ideal of the church that is truly one in love worth living for, even though we fall so ridiculously short of it? The Apostle Paul insisted that it is our faith in such improbable things, not our achievements, nor our obedience, or proper adherence to the liturgy, nor the elegance of our prayers, nor the perfection of our singing, that, that brings us to blessedness. It's not what we do at all. For blessedness doesn't depend on us or our efforts. It's a gift, a gift from God. Our blessedness is out of our control. It's a free and undeserved gift. Paul invites us to trust in that gift, which is Paul's definition of faith. Like Abraham and Sarah, that the promise we pursue through all the challenges and strange twists this life has to offer us. And as we hang on to that promise of blessedness revealed in Jesus we are Abraham and Sarah's children. We are cro closely related to their long hoped for son named Laughter. We at St. Paul's are trusting in a promise that God has a new leader for us who will be our priest in charge. That God is already calling him or her to this new position, even though as yet we don't have any names of candidates. This year's Ash Wednesday, when we prostrated ourselves and reminded that we're but dust and asses fell of old days on Valentine's Day. And Easter, for Christians, the day of God's great victory in Christ falls on April Fool's Day this year. Are we willing to be foolish enough to believe in God's promises? Doesn't it sometimes make you want to fall on your face and laugh? We Christians believe in impossible things. And if it's all true, as I believe it is, wouldn't that be the greatest joke of all? <laughs> <laughs>